Hi there. So last time we were looking at volumes of solids with specific shapes that made up cross-sectional uh, slices. So now what we're going to do is we're going to continue on this idea of finding areas, but we're going to think about areas of revolution. Now if we take some curve and we revolve it, rotate it about some line, some axis, we're going to get some three-dimensional shape. So what I've got here, just two images, just reminding us of what we did last time. Now here we've got like, I don't know, this slug looking like thing, where if we take or to try to find the volume, perhaps we can find the area of a cross-section. Now, volume is always like area, the base, times the height, and we're applying Cavalieri's principle where we can slide things around. But if we have the area of a cross-section somehow, and we give it some thickness, or rather in calculus, some thinness, some infinitely small thinness, now here we've got like a loaf of bread and a slice of bread, we can find the volume of one slice. It's like a stack of paper, a ream of paper. Altogether, we're going to add every single slice of paper with this tiny little thickness gives us an overall area. In terms of calculus, Back to our notion of the limit definition of the integral, what we're doing is we're taking the area of a cross section with some thickness, or thinness if you will, taking an infinite number of those. What we did last time was that translates into the integral, uh, excuse me, the integral of that area with respect to the variable in which we defined the function. What we're going to do now is rather than just look at the solid that overlays a curve or just like that loaf of bread, that slug looking thing up above, we're going to rotate, revolve this around. A little bit easier, or just a little bit different, thinking about this, volumes of revolution. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to find the volume. If we take the curve y equals square root of x between, on the interval 0 to 1, and we're going to rotate it around the x-axis. So the picture here, the image here, what we're going to do is we can find the area of that curve, or, or that shaded region under that curve. What happens is we're going to spin it around. And by spinning it, one of our rectangles becomes this circular disk. And since we had some thickness, dx, our disk is going to have this thickness, delta x, or dx. So our volume, our volume is once again going to be our integral from a to b of the area of one slice multiplied by that thickness. Well, now this thickness, our area, when we are rotating around some axis, our area is pi r squared. And so it's up to us to determine what's that radius so that we can rotate that around. Well, looking back, we're rotating around this line y equals x, so our radius is the height of that curve at whatever value for x we have. I'm going to say my radius, in this case, is that height. For us, it's the square root of x now. So what we have here is our area is pi times the square root of x squared, or our area function in terms of x back to the original curve. It's going to be pi x. We can toss this in, use our integral notation to take an infinite number of those slices, giving us this entire uh, paraboloid shape. So our volume it's then going to be the integral from 0 to 1, because that's the interval over which we're rotating. We're going to have pi. I'm taking pi out as a constant. We've got x dx. We can do this. So that's going to give us, if we anti-differentiate, it's going to be pi times 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to 1. And substituting in 1, subtracting substitution mm -hmm. with 0, we're going to get a volume of pi over 2 cubic units. So the big idea here is when we rotate this, we look at this, thinking back to our rectangular notion for area under a curve, we're going to spin that around, and that rectangle spun around gives us, it gives us a circular disk. We have what we call the disk method for finding the volume of a revolution. It starts off with that area, and then we're going to have the volume. It's going to be pi with the integral from a to b of our radius squared dx, or whatever our variable is. r is our radius uh, relative to the axis of revolution. Let's take a look at another one. Ooh, this time, we're going to be rotating horizontally. So we have the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals x cubed, y equals 8, that's our upper limit, and x equals 0 about the y-axis. So you can see in the diagram, we have this shaded region, and we're going to be rotating horizontally. Now, we had seen this previously when we talked about taking integrals where our rectangles are horizontal. We'd have some thickness dy, since we are moving vertically. All of our slices are moving vertically. So our thickness of each one is going to be dy. Our radius of rotation is now an x distance, so we need to define that x in terms of y. I'm going to take y equals x to the third, and that's going to give us x equals y to the one-third as an equivalent curve. So I'm going to think about my area is pi r squared. My r in this case is the cubed root of y. And so area in terms of y is going to be pi y to the two-thirds. So now our volume, when we rotate that, we're going to have pi, the integral from 0 to 8, because that's our lowest y value, to our upper bound on the y value, of y to the 2 thirds dy. 
this is going to give us 3 pi over 5, y to 5 thirds, evaluated from 0 to 8. And so that's going to give us 3 pi over 5 multiplied by 32. So we've got a volume of 96 pi over 5 cubic units. It's in terms of y instead of in terms of x because we are rotating horizontally and our slices are all moving vertically. Let's keep going. Uh-oh, something's different. The region fancy r enclosed by these curves, y equals x and y equals x squared. So we are looking at the region in between these two curves. Now we can find that area. We've done that before. But that slice is now rotated around. So there's that slice there. That's rotated around. And so it gives us like this open cone figure. So well, we're taking these disks, or rather washers, thinking like nuts and bolts, construction equipment, We've got this washer, so each segment is going to have this washer-like, but still with a dx. Well, we can find the area of the shaded region. Think back to geometry. That would be like the full circle. Take away the inner circle. Ah, so our area, I'm going to write this as pi big R squared, subtract pi little r squared. Where I'm going to use big R is my outer radius. Little r is going to be my inner radius. Well, in this case, our outer radius, big R, since we are rotating about the x-axis, that's going to be the further curve. So that's going to be y equals x. So our big R, our distance from the axis, is going to be defined in terms of x. Our little r, our inner radius, that's going to be the distance from the center from the axis of rotation to the inner curve. So that is a y equals x squared. Our inner radius is going to be x squared. So the area of one washer is going to be pi. In this case, we've got x squared minus x squared squared, x to the fourth. Our volume is then pi times the integral from 0 to 1. And I know it's 0 to 1 because those are the intersection points between those two curves. So we are looking at the area enclosed. We're going from 0 to 1 of x squared. So x, the outer radius squared, subtract x to the fourth, the inner radius x squared squared dx and dx because we are taking vertical slices and we are integrating horizontally. This we can do. So we've got the integral, or volume is going to be integral, that's going to be one third x cubed minus one fifth x to the fifth evaluated from zero to one. And substituting in one and zero, that's going to give us a volume of two pi over 15 cubic units. Well, that's not too bad. Outer area, subtract your inner area, dx. Guess what? We're going to try another one. Now, uh oh, our volume of our solid is going to rotate about the region enclosed by the curves. Okay, same curve, Ooh, but this time we're rotating around an axis that is not the x-axis or not the y-axis. Now our axis of rotation is y equals 2. So thinking about in terms of our curve, this becomes our axis of rotation, y equals 2. Our area is still pi outer radius squared minus pi inner radius squared. So we need to think about what is our outer radius, what is our inner radius. Our outer radius, well, we're rotating about y equals 2. Our outer radius is going to be the distance from 2 to that curve x squared. So it's going to be 2 subtract x squared. You can also see that here, our outer radius from that line 2, 2 subtract x squared. Our inner radius is going to be the distance from our axis of rotation to the inner side. So in this case, that's y equals x. So we have that distance to subtract x, to subtract x. So our area is now pi. It's going to be our outer radius squared, 2 minus x squared, squared. Subtract our inner radius squared, 2 minus x, quantity squared. So our area turns into pi, and now you can multiply this out. It's x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4x. Ooh, we can integrate this. Volume is then the integral pi times the integral from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1, because those are our bounds once again, of x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4x dx. Our volume is then given by pi. That's going to be 1 fifth x to the fifth minus 5 thirds x cubed plus 2x squared, evaluated from 0 to 1. And I'll leave this to you to substitute in and make certain that you can follow the uh, common denominators and fractions. That gives us a volume of 8 pi over 15 cubic units, of course.
So we have this washer method when we have an axis of rotation or we're looking at the area between two curves rotated around something. It's always going to be our area of that washer is going to be the radius, the outer radius times squared times pi, subtract the inner radius squared times pi. And so our volume is always going to be pi outer radius squared subtract inner radius squared dx or whatever our variable of integration is. Let's try one last one. I'm going to take the same curve, y equals x and y equals x squared. Ooh, this time we're going to rotate it around the, the vertical line, x equals negative 1. Now what I'm thinking about is, okay, we are rotating horizontally. That means we're going to have some dy. So we need our curves in terms of y. You can see that there. Our area of one disk is always pi outer radius squared subtract pi inner radius squared. Now here, our outer radius is going to be the distance from the axis of revolution to our outer radius. So we want the distance from x equals negative 1 up to square root of y. So I'm thinking, like, okay, whatever this is, I would subtract this. So our outer radius is going to be square root of y. And I got that by taking y equals x squared. And we're going to have x equals square root of y. So our outer radius is going to be square root of y subtract negative 1, meaning it's going to be square root of y plus 1. Our inner radius is going to be that distance from y equals x, or x equals y, to negative 1. And so we're going to subtract again. Our inner radius is going to be y subtract negative 1, or it's going to be y plus 1. That gives us an area. It's then going to be pi, all right, outer radius squared. We've got y, square root of y plus 1, quantity squared. Subtract the inner radius squared. It's going to be y plus 1, quantity squared. And so we can rewrite this. Our area is going to be pi. That's going to give us 2y to the 1 half minus y squared minus y. Once you multiply that out, simplify things. So our volume, once again, we've got pi times the integral from 0 to 1, because those were still our bounds, of this. We've got 2y to the 1 half minus y squared minus y dy. Since our slices are running vertically, or excuse me, our slices are running horizontally and we are integrating vertically. So when we take the antiderivative, we've got pi uh, where's my notes? Okay, we've got 4 thirds y to the 3 halves minus 1 third y cubed minus 1 half y squared evaluated from 0 to 1. And we can multiply that out. Substituting the values, we get pi over 2. Isn't that cool? See you next time.